I did discover someone recommended to me what looks like a great book on hobo life that, uh, that I had not heard of, and I'm sort of, it just came out a couple of years ago mm. called Citizen Hobo. Mm. And it's a very serious academic sort of history of, of the hobo as a destabilizing social force that uh, in part, according to this writer whose name escapes me at the moment, um, was uh, part of the reason for the sort of manic suburbanization of America was to attempt to get these men to settle down uh, rather than continue to be itinerant workers. And because that was, they were considered to be, a, as I say, a, you know, a, a destabilizing uh, uh, effect on daily life in America. And I suppose a fear that, you know, there were just going to be more and more hobos until everyone was a hobo, which I think is a legitimate fear. Um, and, and in the description of the book, it said, and if you think that you will never look, Franklin Roosevelt in particular was taken with getting the hobo to settle down. And if you, you'll never, after reading this book, you'll never think of the Works Progress Administration the same way again. And that alone is just a startling sentence to write because who would ever think that it would ever be written? And then even more startling because um, and I must have picked up on this somehow in my research. There was a certain amount of research done for the book, but it was very pointedly, very scant and haphazard and largely accidental. So I must have picked up on it because, of course, in my book, uh, in the, the fictional world of my book, the hobos are uh, a, a hugely terrifying force to the United States government that Roosevelt does. He specifically designs the New Deal to as a stealth hobo eradication plan. And of course, you know, comes up, luckily he never put it into effect, but he realized only one thing, stop the hobos, which was polio. Right. But, the, but that didn't, yes, exactly, but that didn't get put into effect because of Pearl Harbor. So you see, that was a situation where I have inadvertently gotten close to kind of truth or this person's interpretation of actual facts. And it probably is due to, you know, having absorbed some of his research indirectly somewhere along the line. But it is sort of strangely uncanny. And then of course, you know, my fear was that people would think I was demonizing the hobo because the hobos are depicted in my book as not so much bad, but just unconstrained, unknowable sort of id type characters that people just can't get. They just are making demands upon America that America doesn't understand, asking for very weird products that no one makes and, uh, and, and, and exhibiting a lifestyle that is incomprehensible to you or, you or me. And that's why they're so feared and, and strange and, and, and uncanny in the book. And, uh, and, and that was what I was going for. But of course, you know, the, the point of view of the, of the narrator of the book, who is me, is that they're awful, drunken, wandering people who, you know, should not have been encouraged. And now they are gone. And, and the people who ride the rails nowadays are, are not actual hobos in the same sense. They're, they're emulators. They're sort of you know, young people, as they do, you know, who ride boxcars and, and try to drop out of society and whatever you may decide of what they're doing, they're not, they're what we call in the hobo observation business phobos. <laughs> so, but then, then I thought, well, you know, but these new young hobos who exist in the real world are going to say, you're totally misrepresenting the hobo life, you're demonizing them, you're making them out to be villains because there's a lot of romance about the hobo in American culture about you know, you know, freeing oneself of the shackles of capitalist society and you know, not, you know, this is why the, the young anarchists sort of are attracted to this legend of the hobo. And, um, and so I, I, I was concerned that by sort of painting them as the dark horse or you know, the, the black sheep of the American family of wandering uh, itinerant workers, I guess, um, that, that I would 
encourage a lot of people, it would make a lot of people angry. Um, but then I was doing some, again, accidental research and listening to some hobo songs. Um, and one of my favorite hobo songs, of course, it's the sort of paramount of the song was the song with Big Rock Candy Mountain. And I was, I was listening to, I think it was an Al Lomax recording of uh, Harry McClintock's, who was one of the dis several disputed authors of the song, the original songwriters. And he uh, apparently had some truck with hobos at some time. And he explained that the song, which is now largely known as a kid's song, was a hobo song about the hobo Valhalla that all hobos would go to where cigarettes grew on trees and you know handouts grew on trees, everything grew on trees. They would just pick and sleep in haylofts and boxcars were empty all the time. And then of course, you know, there are lemonade springs and the bluebird sings and there's soda soda water fountains and everything else. And McClintock was saying in this introduction to the song that in fact one of the uh, most prized possessions in a hobo a hobo could have would be a child that he had conned into going along with him on the open road to do his begging for him or and other things he said very mysteriously and darkly and that the song his theory is that the song was written for hobos to sing as they moved, went from town to town and to sort of you know tempt and lure children to go with them which i thought was a very dark story and then it opened up a fact which is true was that he was absolutely right that there was a, within the whole, all of the hobo romance and all of the lexicon of, of hoboism and all the famous words, you know, the, 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 the slang that the hobo would say and everything else, you know, there is within that language something, you know, a lot of things referring to road kids and the secret society, of, as it were, of young teenagers who had been brought along essentially as punks, as in, 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 as in prison, who would apprentice sexually to a, a hobo and, and be their partner for a period of time until they graduated to full hobo them. And this was a real, a real aspect of hobo life in reality. This is not you nod along and you're secretly pressing a button. But, oh, I thought this was the thing. I apologize. Well, I anticipate all of your questions. My book is a book of complete world knowledge. You can't get there without knowing ahead of time. I'm sorry. I was not. I was taking your, uh, your nodding to be. This is fine, but it in fact, fine. it was you're obviously deranged, and we we need to call this off. No, my nodding. 